Okay, so this is the second part of the PPI lectures, and I'm going to be talking about GPPI. So from last time, uh, make sure you understand the deconvolution bit. Uh, so if you click right here, that'll take you to that video, and you can check it out. And I'm going to do a little review before I get into GPPI, because this is this will set up exactly what GPPI is. So just to, to clarify really quickly, a little lead-in, GPPI isn't really a different PPI. It actually just follows, simply follows the intuitive way that we would normally model an interaction, whereas regular PPI, due to uh, how SPM sets it up, it's not really the most flexible model. Okay, so um, stepping outside of... Um, you know, convolve things. If you just think of a, a typical interaction model, so here we have the seed response. Remember the seed uh, review from last time, that is the, the region that we're using. So we average the, the data in the seed and we're looking at some target. So the target is some voxel in the brain. Now I've, for this example, this cartoon example, I've I just have discrete measures. So, oops, you can think of these as like task activation for blocks or something like that, but that's not quite right. But anyway, whatever, it's discrete. It's easier to understand this way than looking at time series. So um, the example here is that we have two tasks. So the question PPI answers is whether the slope between the activation in the seed and the target differs for two tasks. So it's just a standard interaction model. And normally how we model an interaction, say a group by age interaction, is you have two group ind indicators. Um, then you multiply age times the group one indicator to create a third regressor. And then you multiply age times your group two indicator to get your other regressor. And then you have a total of four regressors in the model. So that looks something like this. Of course, there are other ways to model an interaction, but all of them require four regressors in order to um, have the most flexible model possible. I like this setup because it's really intuitive. Basically, it allows you to have an intercept for each group and a slope for each group. And then the hypothesis of interest would be a contrast comparing these two, um, the parameters for these two regressors, the two slopes to each other. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. It's old hat. You know, hopefully you've been running these models for a while at the group level. So it might look like this. So of course, PPI is dealing with the time series. And as we saw in the last video, there is this deconvolution bit that we use to get at the neuronal signal estimate. Then we create the interaction in the neuronal time dom domain and then we uh, reconvolve it to create the regressors. So what is GPPI? It stands for, I think, generalized PPI. And it's basically this idea on the previous slide, but um, using PPI interactions instead of those simpler interactions. And the idea is if, if you're running a PPI model and you have um, two tests, you're gonna end up with four regressors. And you might be thinking, well, why, what, what's so, what, why is this worthy of a, a whole, you know, what's the big to do, right? Why would we, why wouldn't we just do this? Well, it's because it's not how PPI was set up previously. And if you look at all the older PPI papers, you'll see it set up like this. There's some task regressor. So here, um, task A versus task B. So this could be task versus baseline or something like that. And then you have a um, seed voxel, so that's what this is. Um, and this seed, you can see it's obviously going to be correlated with the task. You're not going to, for a PPI analysis, you're looking at how the connections, the, I shouldn't say connections, well, more on that later, but how the relationship between two regions varies by task. But if your seed region isn't changing by task, uh, the idea is that it's not likely the connections with other regions are going to change by task. So typically the seed is chosen to be a region that's active 
um, differently for the two tasks. So the seed looks like this, and then you create your interaction however you do. In this case, they're just multiplied together, and you get your PPI term. So you can see here, there are only three regressors instead of the usual four to model the interaction. So um, it's a limiting model. <clears throat> Oops, that's a, a repeat slide. So prior to GPPI, that's what it looked like. So three regressors, we should have four. So what does that mean? Well, if I go back to the example I was showing you before, where we have the bold in region A versus region B in the two tasks, normally we want our slopes to be unrestricted for each um, task type. But if we use that style of the PPI, it forces the slope to be centered about, um, to be equal in opposite directions. So they're centered about zero. So this is the analogous model um, here. So you'll see that the fit isn't as good and the slope for the red line is the same in magnitude as for the blue line. They just have an opposite sign and they're reflected about zero. So um, that's not great. That's not what we want our model to do. So, right, then we have this tech note from 2012 by Donald McLaren and others, and it shows that uh, this GPPI or generalized PPI is a better approach. And again, it's just gonna follow our in intuition. And the intuition is our model needs to include a task regressor for each task and an interaction regressor for each task as well. Um, right, so the example I'm gonna focus on, it had three tasks, A, B, and C, and the contrast of interest is the PPI for A versus B. So sometimes there is an effect of uh, A and C, or with C, I should say, a PPI with C, but it's not of interest, but they're still gonna look at how um, the existence of that effect impacts the model fit if you ignore it or include it. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And I, I have to admit, some of the examples I showed earlier, they're not exactly um, parallel. Traditionally, if, if you're, and let me explain why, traditionally you probably are in this three task scenario because the two tasks you're often comparing are something like task A to task B. And the third quote unquote task is your baseline. So um, even this example is a little misleading because you're almost always going to have a baseline as well. So um, yeah, anyway, and, and that's what's missing there. But the analogy is correct, the analogy about the slopes. Okay, so here are the simulations that they ran. Um, so there's one called SPPI plus tasks model. That's SPM's standard PPI. So again, that's only having a single interaction term when you should have an interaction term for each task. So the single PPI term is a PPI for the difference in the two. And that's what I'm saying here, PPI for A minus B. And then there's a task regressor for A, a task regressor for B, and the seed voxel time series. So you might be thinking, wait, Jeanette, there are four regressors. One, two, three, four. But there's also a um, baseline task here. So technically, we need to have um, two for this interaction. If there were only two tasks, say a task A and say B was baseline, then this model would be fine. But in reality, and I'm not even talking about the task C, but you have the, the baseline as well. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Um, for GPPI 2, this is a PPI for A and a PPI for B. Task regressors for A and B, so there are the four regressors and the seed. So the reason the seed is there is to take care of the other non-A, non-B things. And GPPI3 is like the last one, except C is added as well. So you have a PPI for C, 
and a task regressor for C as well. Okay, so here are some of the results. I've uh, cut up the table a little bit just to show a few. When things are in bold, that basically means it's bad. I, I, I wish the results were presented in a slightly different way. Um, what this is showing are the effect sizes. And oftentimes in models, depending on how you set your model up, the effect sizes might look wrong, but your statistic will be fine. It's just because the models parameterize differently. So I don't always, um, I wouldn't rely on looking at effect sizes generally. But here it's fine. Um, I forget what the number in parentheses is. I apologize. Uh, maybe it's the variance. I don't know. We're just going to skip it because the, the point will come through. You shall see. So what's happening here? These are the beta weights. So the beta weight for A is some value A. The, the beta weight for the PPI for B is A minus 1. So what this is telling me is that the interaction effects estimate should be 1 because the difference between these two is 1. There is no PPI with C. The main effect for A, this is just the task activation, is A and then B is A minus 1. So B is 1 larger there. So this would correspond to the intercept. The intercepts are 1 apart and the slopes are 1 apart. Um, then there's the seed activation and then the constant. So now remember I said SPPI, the old way, SPM's way of doing it, it's assuming the slope is centered about zero. So what happens here is that since it isn't, you end up getting um, an underestimate of the interaction effect um, because the model's not fitting it right. So I'm going to flip back really quick. It's analogous to running this model when you really wanted to run something like this. So it's forcing the difference between the slopes to be centered, or the slopes are centered about zero, which then reduces the effect size. Um, I think a, a, a way I would have preferred looking at this is just the residuals or something. And maybe they did. I'm not saying they didn't. Um, I, I read this paper a couple months ago. So anyway, GPPI gets it exactly and GPPI3 also gets it exactly. Again, GPPI3 is just when they added something for C. So, right, when they do add something in for C, we can see that GPPI2 fails because it's not modeling the C effect at all. And uh, let's see, what's this one doing? Now the, the activation for C is related to a and B, so GPPI2 is also off again, but GPPI3 works. And everything is okay, and that's because the slopes now are centered about zero, so SPPI gets it exactly right, and GPPI2 gets it right, and GPPI3 gets it right. See, the numbers are misleading. This one's, it, it, I mean, this one's okay, or this one isn't. Um, anyway, I hope you get the idea. So the moral of the story is, like any model, model everything. If you're modeling an interaction effect, you don't typically just model it. If you have four groups and you're looking at a group by age interaction, you don't just model the age interaction with groups one and two and ignore groups three and four, you're not modeling at all. Um, if you do, your model's not going to fit very well, or possibly it won't fit as well as it could. So you always add all the interaction terms. And that's basically the conclusion here. And they're showing the impact um, when that third thing that you could possibly be ignoring C is ignored. And we basically don't get as good of a fit and your inferences will be off. Uh, one more, uh, it's different here. I think this is just more of kind of the same. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into the details. So a sad fact about PPI is the collinearity tends to be really high. Basically, your PPI interaction term ends up looking a lot like the seed voxel. So one temptation I have seen occur is that people want to remove the seed. You must not do that. You have to keep your seed in the model. So 
it's just a, it's just how it is. Your uh, collinearity is going to be high, so your power is low. So just hope for the best. You know, these results do come out. Um, so as far as GPPI goes, assuming the PPI slopes are equal in magnitude and opposite of, in direction is too limiting. So I highly recommend uh, if you're an SPM user, you use the GPPI toolbox. Now, it turns out that Toolbox was developed for SPM8, and the SPM8 version does not um, translate to SPM12 directly. I did figure out how to make it work earlier this summer, so I will write up those instructions, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, and I will make a blog about how to do that, and hopefully those will work for people. And, um, Right, and if your seed and target are also modulated by a third task of no interest, adding it will improve your model fit, and this is gonna help with power because your residual variance is going to decrease. So that's what we saw with that third task, task C. So, I don't know, it's really intuitive. I'm really glad this paper came out. I, I actually noticed this issue with the way uh, SPM modeled PPI a couple of years before the paper, and. Um, I just I'm kicking myself because I never really thought to write a paper about it. I just started modeling it differently, but it's good to get the message out there so people are um, improving their chances of getting a PPI fit. So that's all I got. Um, so thanks. And thanks. People have been sending me a lot of interesting things. So uh, I will do one more PPI video, I think. I'm going to... Um, some people sent me some things about whether PPI is effective connectivity or functional connectivity. I am still standing by it only being functional connectivity, but apparently there's some argument that it can be effective connectivity. So I'm going to look into that more. Um, the reason I think it can't be effective connectivity is we're simply using one regression model. And regression models do not imply causation. A single regression model does not imply causation. If you run a bunch, you can get causation sometimes, but typically not one. I will look into that and share those arguments hopefully in a couple of weeks. So thanks for your time. Please join the Facebook group or follow on Tumblr or Twitter or all three. And more importantly, enjoy your day.